Whoa, whoa, did not mean that. Oh, the cat jumped on the soundboard. <laughs> This time we watch Season 3, Episode 17, The Saga of the Viking Women and Their Voyage to the Waters of the Great Sea Serpent. <sighs> now we can all be Grimald Warriors! Oh, and we've also got a short, The Home Economic Story! Good, I want to learn about that, but first, we've got some news. Well, this will be old by the time this episode came out, but uh, yeah, Joel just announced a Kickstarter, and as of a couple of hours ago, it met its first goal. Yeah, so yesterday, as we're recording, the Kickstarter was announced properly, and it has already surpassed $2 million raised. So that's cool. There's going to be more work for us. Yes, at least three episodes. <laughs> All right. You can't get rid of us that quickly, Joel. We know you're trying. <laughs> yes, threatened by the far more popular It's Just a Show, which is doing so well with its Patreon. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, this is exciting. This is exciting news. Uh, there'll be more stuff, and it'll be different. And, and uh, honestly, it's a little confusing reading up on exactly what their plan is, but it sounds like some kind of app, and they're going to drop new episodes maybe once a month and something. Maybe they'll have seasons. Maybe they won't. But for now, they're only going to guarantee up to 12 new episodes and maybe 12 shorts. Yeah, and I I love the sound of that. Uh, I mean, personally, I would be I would be totally on board with shorts being a part of the episodes, and I hope that's the case rather than oh, you get like a full length movie and you get a short every once in a while too, because he described them basically as a between meal snack. You yeah. would get them between episodes, but I'm I'm kind of hoping the episodes have shorts anyway because God damn it, that's part of MST3K. <laughs> And I'm curious to see how they're going to be structured. Like, it sounds like they are still going to have a budget and, like, have sets and skits. But it's also maybe going to be a bit more, you know, Zoom call in a sense, but, like, not entirely. I don't know. It's hard to say. Mm. It's really hard to say what these are going to look like. And I think they're still figuring out exactly what that is. But I totally like the fact that it's not going to be run on a streaming service or not a streaming service that they don't own. Yeah. And more importantly, like, the there's nobody dictating what MST3K should be outside of uh Alterniversal Shout Factory and Joel himself. It's it's there's no there's not going to be like make a binge-worthy season, cut the last sketch. Like that's there's no longer going to be uh stuff coming from the top to make MST3K more appealing than it already is. <laughs> You're not going to win over new people. <laughs> Exactly. And it gives them room to experiment and try new things if they want, including, you know, just independent shorts. That could be totally fun. Yeah. I certainly, you know, as we've said before, shorts are great. In fact, the Mads are doing some shorts any day now. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to that. But also just the idea of like a little bite-sized snack. Sometimes I don't want to sit down for an entire 90 plus minutes of MST3K. I just want to watch a little short. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what inspired the great sales of those shorts tapes. Exactly. Exactly. And... Following in the footsteps of those shorts tapes is uh, one of the one of the things that was sort of touted was a potential shorts night hosted by Tom Servo, which seems like a, a fun follow up to the very first shorts tape, which was hosted by Tom Servo. That'll be great. Yeah, it'll be fun. Let Baron stretch a little bit, you know. And uh, if all goes according to plan, new episodes maybe this fall. Yeah, which is which is crazy, and uh, you know, re regardless of what they're doing for COVID, I mean, things are are moving so quickly in places that aren't Canada. <laughs> 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 that who knows what like COVID safety is going to look like by the time they finally start shooting? They may uh, they may actually have a fairly uh, lax thing. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? But as part of this process of getting excited for the new era of MST3K, we put out a little. Article. Yes, it's it's the rare medium article worth reading. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is called Proposition Deep 13. And the idea is that we've picked 13 episodes from each of the 13 seasons so far that you could watch as a kind of quick overview. They're not the best. They're not the most newbie friendly necessarily. I mean, we like them all, but it's more of a guided tour through the entire history of MST3K that you could watch and get yourself all pumped up. Yeah. And, you know, there's enough variety and flavor here that, well, 
you get a sort of real sense of what the show is like and what it's about, what all of its eras feel like. So I think uh, I think this is a good sampler platter. This would be perfect. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we wrote a few paragraphs about each of the movies we picked. And by we, I mean, of course, Adam, myself, and Beth. So those of you who are looking for more Sweet Beth content, get your eyeballs over to Medium. Link in the show notes. All right. Well, we should actually talk about this episode, shouldn't we? Yes, it's about time. We've, we've done enough kind of vamping up front. This time, we watch Season 3, Episode 17, <gasps> The Saga of the Viking Women and Their Voyage to the Waters of the Great Sea Serpent. But first, a short, The Home Economic Story. In this short, we follow four women who go to Iowa State to major in home economics. And uh, that's it. <laughs> it doesn't have the animal cruelty of catching trouble, the tender and taboo love of wood present in why study industrial arts, or the youth's gone mad from what about juvenile delinquency. Hell, there isn't even a home economics sprite to tease the girls for trying to wish for a world without home economics. It's just a show is here to say, officially, that it's just a short and it's got some good goofs in it. And now, our feature presentation. Once upon a time, there was a Viking village named Stanyalt. It's populated by a few dozen men and women, mostly blonde, all in their early 20s, but about half of them have gone missing. Most of the men have gone off on an adventure of some sort, and they're really late coming home. So the women of the village have a vote and decide, yes, they will go look for them. And they set sail, along with a stowaway, the lone remaining boy Viking, Otar, who Joel and the bots call Todd. The Vikings get caught in a swirling vortex with a giant sea serpent, and the boat crashes onto an island. Here, they are captured by the Grimalts and their leader, Stark. Turns out the Grimalts have a deal with the sea serpent, who wrecks boats in order to supply the Grimalts with new slaves. And this is exactly what happened to the menfolk. Desir, who has been acting as the de facto leader of the Viking women, is briefly reunited with her man, Vedric, who has been forced, along with the other men, to work in the mines. But the Grimald warriors want to win over the Viking women for themselves. So they take them on a boar hunt, huh? Eh, okay. Anyway, Stark's son, Senya, falls off his horse and is attacked by a boar, only to be saved by Desir. A girl? Senya begs Desir to let him take the credit for killing the boar, lest he lose all credibility as a Grimald prince and warrior. Desir agrees, and for her trouble, she and the rest of the Viking women are imprisoned. There's one non-blonde Viking woman, Anger the Dark, who's been acting very suspicious this whole time. She manages to sneak out of the prison cell and tries to seduce Stark in order to then seduce Desir's man, Vedric. Well, Vedric isn't interested, and so Vedric and Desir are to be burned at the stake. Yeah, okay. Anger has a change of heart and prays to Thor for rain, and Thor obliges and throws in a bonus lightning bolt to kill Senya the Prince. Because, hey, why not? Anywho, the Vikings now make a run for it. Anger sacrifices herself as a distraction so the rest of the Vikings can get away, and the Vikings get into some conveniently placed boats, quickly kill the sea serpent, and sail home. And so, our series of disconnected and arbitrary events has come to a close. The end. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the Satellite of Love, we have a theme, and our theme is waffles. In the prologue, Joel's gone waffle crazy, and he's offering all sorts of recommendations for consumption of waffles, whether it be accompanied by chili or spinach or hot dogs or whatever you want. The bots are pretty grossed out. For this week's Invention Exchange, the Mads have invented the Meat Reanimator, which brings tasty meats back to what I can only assume is an extremely painful and confusing life. Anywho, they reanimate a chicken. Now, you may wonder what this has to do with waffles, but remember, this is a side dish to what's up on the satellite of love, and what better side dish is there for waffles but chicken? Now, for Joel's part of the invention exchange, he invents a traditional iron that turns ordinary waffles into, well, flat waffles, or, well, pancakes, I guess. In the next host segment, Joel reprograms the bots to crave waffles and love them as much as he does. Following that, in one of the shortest host segments in the history of the show, Joel simply says, Waffles, before movie sign. Personally, I prefer the poopy tape version of this sketch, but this is still pretty great. Next, Tom Servo wishes for a world without waffles, angering Willie the whimsical waffle spirit played by Crow. Crow and Joel show Tom some nightmarish scenarios from a world without waffles. This sketch features, as Tom notes, some excellent line reads from Joel. Finally, we end today's episode with a whimsical song about waffles. In short, waffles, won't you? Waffles. 
Pancakes? Oh, I blew it. Sorry, that's my favorite moment of MST3K, period. I was going to say, yes, that is the poopy tape version of that. That's such a good goof <laughs> and only wasting, you know, a few seconds of tape, so to speak. The way the, way the best goof should is that they're, they're, they're fun and they're inexpensive. <laughs> Uh, so, had you in fact seen the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the Great Sea Serpent before? Here's the question. I'm not really sure. <laughs> because I've seen the home economic story, but that makes sense because it was on one of the shorts tapes, either volume one or two. Um, but I've seen all the sketches. And it's like, it would make sense if I had seen, like, one of the sketches, or I knew the song from Clowns in the Sky, and I knew Waffles from the Pancakes Bit on Poopy. But I'd seen all of the sketches. I just had no memory of the movie whatsoever. To be fair, I knew that I had seen the entire episode at least once, probably several times as a kid. And I didn't remember anything about the movie or the riffs (laughs) within the movie either. Although, like... The movie's terrible nonsense. The riffs are pretty good. Yeah, I really enjoy the riffs. Um, my, I think one of my favorites from the movie was uh, with, with, to the cry of, your gods are false. There is a catty response of, your eyelashes are false. Yes. <laughs> um, and the, the short is just great. Uh, you know, it's an easy joke, but it's still probably my favorite of the short is when all the girls are shown the home economics movie and the principal of the school goes, your period and mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, I mean, all right, as you say, there is absolutely nothing going on in this short. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there's, there's little to discuss. It's still a real good riff, but there is nothing in that short, except the lamp with her name on it. <laughs> K has a lamp with K-A-Y written on it, but it's tilted, so it looks like it says Ray. It's very good. Yes, and the, uh, the while it is in color, the colors are so dour that it may as well be in black and white. Yeah, the K lamp is the only thing that pops. <laughs> That's red tinsel. Oh, boy. Yeah, uh, this movie... Uh, I left last time all excited to talk about Vikings and, you know, cause I just talked about Vikings on another podcast. So it's all fresh in my mind and I'm like Vikings and Viking women. And this is going to be great. This movie had nothing to do with Vikings. Well, I mean, all those, uh, all those ladies are Viking women. You say that, but they're mostly from California. <laughs> Yes, but uh, they're supposed to be Viking women, in much the way that uh, when you watch a spaghetti western, an Italian guy is supposed to be, you know, a native chief. Yeah, this is nothing. This has nothing to do with anything Viking. They're not even trying. No, but uh, I, I, I will I will say this, unlike, <laughs> unlike the previous movie that we watched, uh, I feel like this movie moves. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, oh, yeah. I didn't feel trapped in the movie at all, and uh, every now and then I was re- rewarded with either an extremely camp performance or a delightful sea serpent the sea serpent was uh how did how did mary joe peel describe it in the, in the amazing colossal episode guide uh the special effect was perfectly reasonable and and that's the best you can hope for on a corman budget i i think i mentioned that there's nothing going on in this home economics short but one thing i can tell you about home economics it does come up in it is that sometimes it involves cooking and surely sometimes what you're cooking is waffles. Mm-hmm. And how often do you get to cook waffles in your home economics storybook life, Chris? Me? Yeah. So I don't own a waffle iron. No. And I don't usually get frozen waffles. Very occasionally we will. But uh, so, so I don't get to make them very often. Do you have a waffle iron? Do you make waffles? You know, it's funny. I uh, I don't really make waffles but i was raised on eggo waffles as i think like most kids my age were yeah there was plenty of eggo waffles in the fridge all the time when i was a kid yeah that was that was kind of it uh every now and then i will go by the corner store and pick up one of the sugary waffles that they have as a snack um but no uh, uh waffles waffles aren't really a part of my diet I, I still make pancakes but i do not make waffles okay so let's 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 do this real quick a few episodes ago when beth was on we talked a little bit about stuffing or potatoes so now the equivalent brunchy question pancakes or waffles well if i'm at brunch i can i can make pancakes at home they're real easy to make (laughs) 
and and pancakes are never fancy. I'm sorry, I've been to Denny's and I know fancy. They never make them <laughs> fancy over there. But not even when they've got the little smiley face discs of banana cooked into them. No, I won't even count that. You've got to put in a little effort in order to impress me. That don't impress me much, as Cheryl Crow or Shania Twain once sang. One of the two. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> or Fran Drescher. Who knows? So, so when you're out eating a brunch, you're going to get yourself a waffle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would much rather have a waffle. Plus, it's just, it's just so pleasing. It's like, ooh, all the little, all the little holes. It's like, oh, it's so nice. It's, it's a, it's a taste sensation, and it traps all the delightful syrup or butter. I mean, I have to agree for the same reasons. Like, it's got the nice crust. It's got the nice fluffy middle, and I can't easily make it at home because, as I said got no waffle iron so listeners please uh, support us on patreon so we can get ourselves some waffle irons but until that happens i'm only gonna have waffles when i'm out um now you mentioned the little syrup buckets in the waffle the little syrup squares in the waffle which is true it's delightful for that sort of thing in the sketch uh the bots are particularly freaked out by other types of waffles savory spinach and ricotta waffles or chili waffles or baked beans and waffles things like that do you agree or disagree with that well i will say this when it comes to waffles is that while i prefer sweet waffles for breakfast or brunch i i I am a man of the world i have had chicken and waffles i know how good that can be so (laughs) i'm open to trying it i'm open to your chili waffles why not I mean, I haven't had chicken and waffles because vegetarian, but I actually have had vegetarian chicken and waffles, which I think was just breaded in fried tofu or something on waffles with syrup. That was very good. But I've also gone to places where they had sort of savory waffles. I've had waffles with spinach in the waffle and ricotta on the waffle. How was that? And it's fantastic. It's exactly what you want. It's just instead of being sweet, it's savory, but it's still got the crenellations. It's still got the crispy exterior and the fluffy interior. It's real nice. Mm. Like, that's the one thing I have about this sketch. I don't get what these bots are so upset about. All of these waffle options are basically fine. (laughs) Well, remember, Joel is worldly and has experienced many things, whereas the bots are, at this point, only about four years old. But I do remember that, like, back in the day, I probably would have thought differently. Because the first time that I saw savory waffles, I found it very confusing. (laughs) You know, as as you said, grew up with Eggo waffles and never occurred to me that waffles could have so many options. And so when I went to my first waffle restaurant in, in, let's say, 2005 or 6-ish, I was pleasantly surprised. I was skeptical, but pleasantly surprised. Now, we, we've talked a lot about the, the edible uses for waffles, but Chris, have you ever had any alternate uses for a waffle? I've never worn waffles as earrings. I've never used them as acoustical tiles. I've never used them to create weird impressions in a snow for some sort of movie project. What are you thinking of? Uh, I have specifically used them as part of a series of movie projects. Okay, okay, good. (laughs) Uh, When myself and my pals were in high school, shortly after we had discovered MST3K... um, I uh, I was the one who spread that virus among my friends. We decided to make our own B movie, which I wrote, which was the original was called "The Day It Rained Waffles," and we crudely photoshopped uh, the uh, Dawn of the Dead cover. Here, I'll put put that a link. Oh no! In that I don't. I unfortunately do not have the uh, the movie itself. The no, I do not have the movie itself. That does not survive. Uh, nor do I have the image of the poster. But I can show you what the Dawn of the Dead poster originally looked like. We can have a link to that in our show notes, so you can probably see it now. Yep, so it's got the sort of horizon with a cartoonish head with a sort of red birthmark. Yes, and uh, with the immortal tagline, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Yes. Uh, And the text sort of on the ground, as it appears. Uh, We we photoshopped, (laughs) well, not Photoshop, we used MS Paint to create a waffle on the horizon. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Using the slogan, when there's no more room in hell, the waffle will walk the earth. (laughs) I think you could recreate that pretty easily if you wanted to. We it, hundreds of man hours were spent. <laughs> <laughs> now, if the pl- the the plot of the film, if I recall correctly, uh, was about e- an alien invasion and uh, all the sentries for the alien, all the soldiers were waffles, and waffles were essentially uh, a deadly devices. They could be ninja stars or buzzing saw blades from one moment to the next. There is a particularly charming moment that I. 
will never forget, in which I, as director, uh, was directing uh, my best friend Curtis to play the lead character. And he had to... Uh, he had to utter one line uh, in in one scene where uh, he he says like this isn't blood it's maple syrup president's choice and the line reading got muffled and rather than wait a few weeks for him to be available again where he had gone off to do something else I think he was off at like summer camp or something I just got I said no we have to get this done right now so I got another guy to like dub in the last part of the line so you have one voice going he's like no this isn't blood it's maple syrup and then somebody else goes president's choice <laughs> and that's still a running joke between myself and my friend Curtis <laughs> that's great yeah it, it was loads of fun so I guess the, the lesson that I have learned from these waffle sketches, uh, or at least the one I'd like to impart onto listeners, is make a movie. Well, I think it's about time for The Day It Rained Waffles to get a nice reboot. A Kickstarter will be starting soon. Sign up. There's a $2 million goal and a few stretch goals at the higher levels. I think we can do this. Come on, Misties. Let's make it happen. You can get a shirt if you pledge. Well, Adam, in times like this, I always turn to you because although we've done one or two movies from him before. I just I just need to know a little bit more about Roger Fodger Corman and his empire and how this ding dang movie came to be the way it is. Well, that's where I need to take you into a little place we call the Corman Corner or the Corner. The Corner. Thank you, theme squad. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, one of the most striking things about this movie is the title. Yeah, it's a, let me, let me see it again. The saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the great sea serpent. And that's the show. That's, we're out of time. <laughs> See, that to me is very, very telling, uh, because it's not Viking women, it's not Viking women versus the sea serpent, it's not the great sea serpent, it's merely a voyage to the waters of the great sea serpent, letting you know that you're not going to be seeing a lot of that great sea serpent. <laughs> that's true, and you sure don't. You know, that's why they call him Honest Raj, <laughs> uh, as it was Roger Gorman who came up with the title. Samuel Z. Arkoff and James Nicholson were always looking for punchy titles for their movies and ones that would like explain the plot very easily so you could get teenagers to go see it. And the best that Roger could come up with was the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the Great Sea Serpent. <laughs> that's the only thing he could come up with that would explain the plot as concisely as possible <laughs> <laughs> the plot as if this has much of a plot but anyway yes um i mean i can't imagine this title really brought in a lot of people no i i don't think this is one of the more successful roger corman movies although it, it you know this may surprise you but it was inexpensive <laughs> oh no, yeah no, that makes sense <laughs> so it, it also uh it also you know could be the fact that it was like it was so cheap it was it was too small to fail right uh, a quote uh, from Corman himself about the making of the movie is that he said, I did learn an important lesson uh, on the making of this movie. Don't fall for a sophisticated sales job about elaborate special effects. What elaborate special effects? Well, that's just it. Well, most of the money went to that great sea serpent. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of cute, but like... Not, that's not a much of a special effect. It's just like a little plastic toy running around in a tub. It is probably the most convincing Roger Corman effect ever. All right, fine, but again, low bars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's just it. Jack Rabin and Irving Block, uh, they were the special effects team who came to Corman with the script, and they were matte painting experts. Okay. So they presented a series of paintings of how good the movie could look. Oh, they like over storyboarded it. Yes. And their whole deal was they wanted a percentage of the profits instead of a salary and a small amount of money to do the film's effects. And Corman thought the script was whack, but wanted to see the promised spectacle of a movie that looked more expensive than it cost. And that's what they were promising. And Roger Corman is all about not spending that extra dime. <laughs> now, were there matte paintings in this movie? There's one, because I, I read that and I thought, is there? And I had to rewatch the episode. And there's a matte painting when when they are rowing. Uh, there's a backdrop of the sky. And there's also uh, an, at least one more matte painting at the end when they're making their way back to Viking territory. That wasn't just a back projection of sky? 
No, no, no. Oh. No, that was a painting. They even like call it out in the episode. Yeah, I suppose. But it's just sky. That's not like what I, I want a castle in the distance that they're walking up to from just the corner of the screen. That's uh, that's the best they could do because they shot this movie in 10 days. And this was Corman's calamity. He knew that this is like a terrible idea to make a low budget version of this kind of movie on 10 days without any real special effects. Because, again, the closest they got to special effects was the monster. And the monster is decent for a Roger Corman movie of the 50s. But that's about it. Yeah, it's not, that's not going to sell tickets. That's, nobody's going to be like, oh, you should go see this movie. The special effects are amazing. It's got five minutes of a creature. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, what did you think of Abby Dalton, who plays our lead in this movie? Who plays Desir? Yes. She's fine. I don't know. <laughs> nobody, nobody really puts in a stellar performance in this movie. But they're all adequate. They're all fine. I mean, Susan Cabot, who plays, you know, the is she bad black haired woman? Mm -hmm. She probably put in the best performance. But no. But tell me about uh, tell me about Desir. Well, with Desir, uh, she was not the original Desir. Oh, yes. So uh, from Jack Bohr, who was the uh, not the Bohr in the movie, uh, he was the AD on the movie. Right. Uh, they lost the original actor on the first day. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, Abby Dalton was originally cast in the movie as someone else, and the actress and her agent figured they could pressure Roger Corman into more money. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how Roger Corman works. <laughs> no. I can't believe, like, and Roger Corman, this wasn't his first rodeo, so the idea of, like, don't worry, babe, we're going to get money out of that Roger Corman fella, and you're going to be rich. Rich, I tells you, is the dumbest plan ever conceived by man. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we get into uh, Abby Dalton, who actually was in involved romantically with Corman after the movie. Oh. Yeah. I hope they were very happy together. They uh, they did. They, While well, things didn't work out, she still spoke very highly of Corman and uh, said he was a terrific date. Yeah, that's fine. Things don't have to like be forever to be great. No, no, no. Always, I think every moment with Roger Corman is a cherished moment. Early in the episode... When we watch the opening credits to this movie, the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the great sea serpent, the composer's name comes up, Albert Glasser, and Joel and the bots give a mighty round of applause for the name. Albert Bravo! Glasser! Yay! Albert Glasser! Paging Albert Glasser! And uh, he even gets a shout out later on in the movie. Yep. Albert Glasser at his best. <laughs> now, was that round of applause earnest or sarcastic, do you think? <laughs> I think it's safe to say what it is. Uh, and I will tell you, but we, I must abscond from the, uh, the, the corner corner or the corner and move on to another corner known as the scorner. <laughs> To tell you. All right. So tell me about Mr. Albert Glasser. Well, it's safe to say that the applause is sarcastic because uh, one of the quotes from, from Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, in an episode I cannot place is they describe him as the man who holds you down and pummels you with music. Yep. <laughs> yeah, this was not their first rodeo with Albert Glasser. He did a lot of episodes of MST3K. Yes. In fact, the complete rundown of Albert Glasser MST3K movies are Invasion USA, Beginning of the End, Viking Women and the Sea Serpent, of course, The Amazing Colossal Man, War of the Colossal Beast, Teenage Caveman, Earth vs. the Spider, and High School Confidential. Now, I assume that by Viking Women and the Sea Serpent, you mean the saga of the Viking Women and their voyage to the waters of the Great Sea Serpent? I had to catch my breath while I was reading the list, so yes. Fair enough, fair enough. Are all those movies Roger Corman movies? Uh, no. In fact, most of them are Bird Eye Gordon movies. All right. Uh, in fact, I think the only ones that Corman did were uh, the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the Great Sea Serpent. Close. Yeah, I tried. I tried without <laughs> looking, which is not bad. <laughs> But uh, he he'd scored uh, our, our, our delightful film, our delightfully long-named movie, and uh, Teenage Caveman, and that's it. That's the only one. Unless High School Confidential is a corner movie, and I don't think it is. 
But yes, so you, who, you may ask, is Albert Glasser? Yes, I, I did ask that. Well, you're about to find out, so it's a good thing you asked. Good, good, good. <laughs> See, uh, he has, it, it makes sense that he's been featured on MST3K so many times, because he has 104 credits as a composer on the IMDb alone. <laughs> So you were bound to get, what, 10 of them in yes. MST3K's 200-odd films? It was guaranteed to happen. That's why there's so many John Williams movies in MST3K. <laughs> All right, 100 and change. Great. That's a lot. Did he? I, I'm guessing he recycled some of those scores. Uh, I think it's safe to say that you can hear a little bit of The Amazing Colossal Man <laughs> in our feature <laughs> film today. Probably. They're not memorable scores, is the thing. No, that's just it. I, uh, I, I, found, I found, based on his work featured on MST3K, that Albert Glasser is the rare composer born without personality, or at least rare for the time. It's quite common these days. <laughs> <laughs> but he at least has like kind of an interesting backstory. Oh, good. He first got work as a copyist at the age of 19 for Warner Brothers. So that's copying music out. Yes, that's right. Uh, he was not a copywriter, nor was he a copycat. <laughs> No. Well, not yet. <laughs> only for himself. Only for himself. And frankly, if James Horner can do it, why can't Albert Glasser? Fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, uh, yes, so he is a, an up-and-coming copyist. And sure enough, well, he worked there with uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold and Max Steiner, two of the biggest names in the golden age of film scores. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so he was working as a copyist and an arranger for about nine years before getting his big break for a Poverty Row movie called The Monster Maker in 1944. Okay. That's where he gets his first score in. So he didn't go fight the Nazis in the war. <laughs> no, he had better things to do. <laughs> Sorry. He had monster makers to make. <laughs> okay, good, good. He needs to, yeah, you, you got to keep him entertained here so they can win over there or something. Yes. Also, buy war bonds. Um, <laughs> so he he does uh, his usual shtick, which is fairly unmemorable scores. But there is something that sticks out, even though it's not something I'm familiar with because it's way before my time. I should ask my dad. Um, his scores for the films The Cisco Kid Returns and The Cisco Kid in Old New Mexico were popular enough that they were reused for every episode of the 50s Cisco Kid TV series. Huh. Yeah, so he he did become really familiar to an American audience for a popular show. I mean, nobody ever talks about it much nowadays, but... No, it had no longevity, but... I have heard of it as a thing that people once watched many years ago. Yes, and I'm familiar with that song that goes, Cisco Kid was a friend of mine. That's about okay. it. Okay, yeah. No, you, you you beat me. You win. You win the Cisco Kid round. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's that's ultimately the last note on Albert Glasser. He never quite crossed over to mainstream success, despite his association with the Cisco Kid and his prolific B movie scores. He died in 1998. His final credit is a posthumous one for a movie that was released in 2005, I believe. But yeah, that's about it. Like he's again not our greatest composer, but a few interesting things about him, and of course uh, needs to be mentioned given how much attention is given to him for this episode. <laughs> hey everybody, it's time for the Shadow 13. It's time for the Shallow 13. 13 bite-sized waffles slathered in details about this episode, the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the Great Sea Serpent. Go, Adam, go! Let's start at the very beginning, the opening credits. The clip from The Crawling Eye that has been part of the intro since the first season has been replaced with a clip of Godzilla dropkicking Megalon from episode 212, Godzilla vs. Megalon. Oh man, if only they had that uh, clip of Godzilla flying of his own accord from Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. But who knows, maybe in season 13. During the opening credits of the movie, Crow jokes that the film will contain a cameo by Wilfred Hyde White. Plus Wilfred Hyde White as the uncredited cameo appearance. <laughs> we'll always remember Hyde White as one of the stars of The Million Eyes of Sumeru. Or, you know, maybe we won't. But we discussed that film in It's Just a Show episode 82. Irving Block provided the film's story and its special effects. Now, he also did the effects for Rocketship XM, which we talked about all the way back in It's Just a Show's debut episode. But Block's name on the script could have potentially fooled moviegoers into thinking this 1957B movie was a great motion picture. The previous year, Block co-wrote the story for Forbidden Planet. Yes, that Forbidden Planet. Weird. June Kenny, who plays Asmilt in today's movie, also appeared in Earth vs. the Spider, also Rift in Season 3, and Bloodlust, Rift in Season 6. And, you know, we'll get to those someday. 
The segment where Tom wishes for a world without waffles, and Crow as Willie the Waffle tries to teach him the error of his ways, that's a tribute to A Case of Spring Fever, the short where a middle-aged man wishes for a world without springs, only to incur the wrath of Coily the Spring Sprite. We talked about this short on It's Just a Show episode 67, since it was riffed with Squirm in the penultimate episode of the show's 10th season. Mike offers an explanation for the waffle sketches in the Amazing Colossal episode guide. Quote, No one at Best Brains remembers exactly how we got on the waffle kick, but I do remember rejecting a number of very strong ideas in favor of doing the whole waffle theme. I wonder now if among those ideas was one that was both funny and touching, something pointedly humorous yet eminently human. (laughs) Did we reject an idea that might have won us a Pulitzer Prize? He continues, These are the thoughts I wrestle with, alone in the caligonous doom, with only a faint crepitation in the treetops and the sound of my old sowing hound. And yet, is there not something noble and wonderful about the lowly griddle-fried quick bread? And who among us doesn't see something of themselves in the buttery, biscuity dryad as portrayed by Crow T. Robot? Yes, and in the waffle song, I hear America singing. I sound my mighty waffly yop over the rooftops. I sing the griddle electric. I'm glad we did the waffle show. Glad, I tell ya. Glad! <laughs> glad! As the prince is mourned by the ruler of wherever the hell this takes place, Tom blurts out, My son. I love my dead gay you son. the far land of- This, of course, is a line from the 1980s film Heathers. After a murdered homophobic jock is found with a forged suicide note claiming he was gay, his grieving father utters this immortal line, which later inspired the song Dead Gay Sons in the Heathers musical. Hmm. As one of the women looks for a book in the library in today's short, Joel goes, Hmm, let's see... Day after day, Ooh, she had passed ourselves. by that little book. The bell jar. Now oh, here it, it is. Ghetto, the Ghetto Freaks. A there it is. Future. Ghetto Freaks is a 1970 exploitation film that had some trouble deciding who to exploit. Originally titled Sign of Aquarius, the film meanderingly follows the lives of some hippies. But hippies don't sell, so they add two minutes of footage of black people doing a blood ritual, change the title to Ghetto Freaks, and try to cash in on the black exploitation market. Unsuccessfully. In another scene during our educational short, Crow quips, Here, Carol Bly explains her principles. Carol Bly was a short story writer and essayist who, I'm being told, focused largely on Minnesota women who have to sort of wake up sheeple and deal with the everyday evils around them. She even put out a book of ethics called Changing the Bully Who Rules the World. It all sounds real Midwestern, but I don't know. If you've read her, write in. Tell us what you think. Carol Bly was married for several decades to Robert Bly, the guy who wrote Iron John, a book about men, and who argued that the myths of so-called primitive men would help today's men grow up and act like real men, rather than man-children. By the 90s, he was holding retreats in the woods to help men achieve this manlier state. And, sure enough, Robert Bly also makes an appearance in the riffs. When the prince loses an arm wrestling match to a girl, Crow quips, You, young man, are going on a Robert Bly weekend. Also, during that riveting arm wrestling scene, Joel makes a reference to Over the Top. It's actually Over the Top with Sly Stallone. Over the Top was the rare film to ask, what if a father and son could bond over arm wrestling competitions? The film starred Sylvester Stallone and was unsurprisingly produced by the Go-Go Boys, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, whom we discussed previously on It's Just a Show episode 52 on Outlaw of Gore. And finally, in reference to the young Viking guy with a perm, Tom says, It's Todd Knotts as the Reluctant Viking. That's good. The always lovable Don Knotts starred in 1967's The Reluctant Astronaut, the story of a simple janitor who unexpectedly gets sent into space? Hey, wait a minute. And that's time! All right. So, you would think that perhaps... Roger Corman would be the last name, the the ultimate word when it comes to cheap movie producers. No, I wouldn't. I've watched this show long enough. But, <laughs> uh, but go on. I'll, I'll play along with your bit. For sure. He's terrible and no one could possibly be cheaper than him. 
Ah, but that's where you're wrong. <laughs> oh, no, wrong again, Adam. Yeah. You've lost another Crypt Keeper or not. Ah. <laughs> Yes, this is where uh, there is a reference uh, in today's episode to trauma movies. Trauma presents the Vorm School Viking Girls. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So it would be remiss if we did not discuss trauma and their founder, one Lloyd Kaufman. Okay. Uh, trauma movies. There's like, there's a Tromeo and Juliet. There is a Tromeo and Juliet. I'm impressed that you knew that. And there's like a tomato based one. Uh, I think you're thinking of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, which is not them. Oh, all right. Sorry. But it feels like it could be. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm wrong. This is where, uh, you know, a uh, a trauma person, a tromi, uh, a tromeo uh, would know is that uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes would be way more vulgar if it was a trauma movie. That's true. It's not like I've seen any of these movies. <laughs> it's it's perhaps best that you saw the cover for The Toxic Avenger and thought to yourself, not today. Mm. But yes, that's where uh, Lloyd Kaufman, uh, he, that's his claim to fame. He, he created the Toxic Avenger, and that's what launched the Troma movies. And he's been a producer and distributor of movies ever since. So, so the Toxic Avenger was a film originally, or was it like a comic book or something? No, no, no. It's a totally original product from Troma. They own it. It's their baby. It's Lloyd Kaufman's baby. And he has milked it for all it's worth <laughs> because <laughs> there are count them four Toxic Avengers movies that I know of, ending with uh, Toxic Avenger 4, Citizen Toxie. And <laughs> there is a reboot that is planned, so there might be five by the time this episode comes out. Uh, there is a Toxic Avenger musical. Uh huh. There is a novelization that came out in the 90s. Well, you have to have that. Yes. But they didn't get Alan Dean Foster. I'm pretty sure Lloyd Kaufman did that himself. I'm sure there have been video games. There have been video games because, remember, Lloyd Kaufman was around in the 80s. And in the 80s, you could get R-rated movies turned into Saturday morning cartoons. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened with the cartoon series Toxic Crusaders. Oh, no. Yes, it was awful, but it had a great theme tune written by Chuck Lorre, now better known for writing bad sitcoms, but at the time, writing one of the greatest theme songs, the theme to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a bop, but Toxic Crusaders. Toxic Crusaders. Very, very catchy. All right. I'll trust you on this one. <laughs> it's totally worth listening to. It's worth watching an episode just for that. Not the whole episode, just the opening credits. Uh, but yes, uh, Lloyd Kaufman is an independent through and through. He's uh, he's living in New York, and that's where Troma headquarters are. Troma headquarters are uh, a building in Hell's Kitchen that have Toxie, the Toxic Avengers head on the uh, as kind of a gargoyle on the building. Oh, they built their own building? No, they just added that to oh, uh, just okay. above the front okay. door, right. which is neat. <laughs> that is <laughs> which, neat. Which is very very neat, and that's that's the thing about Lloyd Kaufman is that unlike Roger Corman, uh, he totally knows who he is and has a sense of humor about himself what where where should people start if they want to know more about what the trauma films are like assuming they haven't already and yet are compelled to now the best trauma movie as far as i can tell because i've only seen a handful of them because trauma often crosses the line into hey we're trying to be bad and i don't care for that right but I, I I will say this the uh, the most charming trauma movie they've seen and one of the easiest ones to go down for a mainstream audience is Tromeo and Juliet. Right, I have heard people say that that is pretty watchable. Yeah, it's narrated uh, as as all Shakespeare movies should have been by Lemmy Kilmister of Motorhead fame. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you okay. know oh, that's the best part of the movie? No, no, I didn't somehow. Somehow I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the best part of the movie between that and uh, Juliet giving birth to a pig. Okay. Because it's a trauma movie. That sounds trauma. Yes. Huh. Uh, and you know what? I, I do love, I like, I love Lloyd Kaufman himself. He seems to be like the king of, he, he seems to be a mixture of like, like there's definitely the Uncle Lloyd persona that he puts on for every behind the scenes kind of feature, every, every kind of, like all the trauma movies would have commercials for other trauma movies. And they would essentially be hosted by Lloyd Kaufman doing this exaggerated Stan Lee shtick where he's the mayor of Traumaville. Right. And so he's just sort of full of bad jokes and, and kind of like a wild, a wild, uh, wannabe Mel Brooks energy. Great. And 
that's that's a lot of fun. And then there's the the real Lloyd Coffin who seems to be <laughs> a little tired and a little bitter, and I like that more. <laughs> 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 I'll be honest with you. All right. Uh, he he wrote a book, uh, a very inspiring book called "Make Your Own Damn Movie" about how to make movies with limited funds. That sounds good. Yeah, which also recounts like basically his days of making movies in the early days. Does he suggest using waffles as main enemies? No, he never did. That's totally an original Adam Clark idea. <laughs> okay, well maybe it's time for you to write your updated version of it. Yes, for the terrible, terrible short films I've made over the years. Yeah. Uh, but I do like how, like, no bones about it he is in his uh, in his book, because that book opens with uh, <laughs> the fact that rats had taken over the trauma building in the 90s. Oh, no. Well, it was New York in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. He said, uh, and I quote, I was surrounded, this is how the book opens, I was surrounded on every side by vermin, roaches, and rat shit, and I wasn't even meeting with the executives at Blockbuster. Hey, I get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he basically describes, and again, another passage from the book, this is how he describes his world it's like this was the world of filmmaking that i knew no limousines no craft services no imported bottles of water to wash the starlet's hair just a never-ending basement full of shitty moldy rat rat feces that had to be cleaned out why the fuck was i doing all this yeah that's sort of how i lived for a lot of the 90s and i didn't make any movies no, no i take that back i might have made one or two movies as a treat yeah, well, everyone should make a movies, and everyone, and I think a person can be allowed to have a movie as a treat. Good, I agree. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I have to give, uh, you know, trauma credit. Like the the person who go. This is a one thing that uh, you know, answering that question of why he does this. Uh, uh, Lloyd Kaufman writes, the person who goes to the trauma movie knows that he or she may love the trauma movie or he or she may hate the trauma movie, but the movie goer knows that he or she will never forget the trauma movie. And having seen several trauma movies, I can say that that's true. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. What else could we talk about? Um, well, there's that moment early on. Crow sees Anger the Dark, the very suspicious Viking woman with the black hair played by Susan Cabot, and says, It's Kate Bush! Despite the fact that she basically looks nothing like Kate Bush. <laughs> no, Susan Cabot would lose any Kate Bush look-like contest. Indeed, to me. And I definitely don't look like Kate Bush. I think there's many lovely drag queens that would win that contest. <laughs> but Crow decided to arbitrarily throw in a Kate Bush reference. And why can't we talk about Kate Bush for a while? Yeah, that's why we've decided to arbitrarily throw in this segment. <laughs> this is literally what the whole point of their show and our show is. Are you a big Kate Bush fan? I uh, love Kate Bush. In fact, it was your husband, uh, Michael, who introduced me to Kate Bush. <laughs> Perhaps predictably. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I have to say, up front, I love some Kate Bush songs and deeply respect Kate Bush, but never loved her super much. Like, the only album of hers that I know really well is the most recent one that came out not 10 years ago, because, you know, I was living with my husband at that point, and he was playing it around the house, and it's a lovely album, very wintry album. But, like, I have listened to some of her early albums through, and certainly my husband has played them on in the background, but, like, I've never just really had a period where I sat down and listened to her classic work through and through like a proper fan would. I got basically the best of. In fact, she has a best of that's called like her story, the Kate Bush <laughs> best songs, uh, whatever it's called. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's basically what I, I was introduced to the singles via the music videos. And, you know, there's no better way to get introduced to Kate Bush than by her music videos. Yes, her music videos are fantastic. Also, that compilation is called The Whole Story, which is not nearly as bad as her story. <laughs> <laughs> but I but was close. <laughs> it was close. It was close. Um, yeah, her music videos are almost universally fantastic. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in fact, I have a favorite. I was I was going to ask you yours, but uh, I'll go ahead with mine. Uh, Sat in your lap. Ah, oh, is probably the best one for me. Yes. So, Sat in your lap. Do you want to do you want to describe Sat in your lap, the song, for people <laughs> who may not have heard it? Uh, Sat in your lap. The best way I could describe this song is that only one person could ever cover it, and that's William Shatner. <laughs> Sat in your lap is like Kate Bush at her most prog. I guess it's got really wild 
time signatures. It's got really spiky instrumentation. It's got weird backing vocals from people. And the lyrics are really intense and take a while to unpack. That was the first Kate Bush song that I heard in More Than Passing, because a friend of mine put it on a mixtape for me way back in the day when I was a teenager. Oh, wow. And I loved the song and had no interest in following up on the artist. <laughs> You're like, they clearly peaked. This is great. I'm scared. I don't know if that was <laughs> quite it, but it was something like that. Um, yeah, I think it took a while for me to really grow to like it, but I, I definitely did by the end of it. And I still love it. And the video is also completely... Yes, and prominently featuring Kate Bush on roller skates. And like everybody wearing really pointy white dunce caps. Yes, there's the dunce caps and there's also the masks yes. that they wear. Um, it's basically a $5 version of Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut orgy scene. Uh, <laughs> it's gr But it's great and it's better directed. Um, it's uh, I t completely fell in love with it and, and that seems to be it. It's like when it comes to Kate Bush, I seem to like it when she goes full weird more more than usual because like a lot of kate bush music is weird yes and 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 it stands out that way but there's definitely like songs that go overboard with the weirdness and i'm more drawn to those uh sat in your lap is one and uh her penultimate album of her original kind of run of albums which goes up to the early 90s is called the sensual world and i think that might be my favorite album of hers even though it's very uneven mm. and uh it's it's so kind of uneven to the point that she decided to tinker with it later for a, a special edition re-release uh when she george lucas fight it but we'll talk about that a little, a little bit later um i absolutely love a song that's on there that is fantastic musically it's got these great wailing guitars these memorable synths and it's just so insanely catchy but it also plays out like the world's worst o henry story in which <laughs> a woman is dancing with someone who is incredibly charming and agile and graceful and witty and that person turns out to be as she looks in the newspaper the next day Hitler. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And it features the immortal line, it couldn't be you, it's a picture of Hitler. He go, do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there are a few Kate Bush songs with really questionable turns in them, but the music is very good. <laughs> that album also has uh, The Sensual World, the title track on it, which is also lovely. Banger. And is supposed to have an extended quote from Molly Bloom's speech at the end of Ulysses. And and uh, the James Joyce estate wouldn't let her use it originally, but then uh, I believe that she eventually got the rights, or I think it's now public domain, so she was able to re-record it, and good for her. Yes, that's what got put on uh, the aforementioned George Lucas fight album. Um, because I, I, I mentioned that there's a terrific song on there called Deeper Understanding. Mm-hmm. And Deeper Understanding is kind of an interesting song about someone who go, who retreats further and further into the world of the home computer oh, yes. in, in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little precursor to her. Yes. Uh, but again, done with, say, Microsoft Sam and Solitaire and such. <laughs> uh, but... To represent the, the computer, to give the computer a voice, Kate Bush originally used this beautiful choir that, uh, that sang out, you know, hello at one point, and it sounds so, so beautiful, and their, their voices are used incredibly well in that song. But to update the song for the special edition that she put out, uh, is she, that she actually used like an electronic voice. She used like uh, a vocoder or some damn thing. And that beautiful hello has been turned to hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ruining the song. Yeah, but more accurate to the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, what did you think of her most recent album, the very wintry piano-y one? I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it as much as the album prior to that. I mean, it's a really different album for her. It's very listenable in a in a way that, uh, oh yeah, like it's very it's very calm and soothing and like a like you know music to go with a fire on a wintry night. Yeah, it's a good album. It just wasn't as much for me as previous Kate Bush albums were, including like uh, her then most recent album, whose name I forget, but it has that great song about pie called Pie. Yeah, Ariel. Yes. Yes, Pi, in which she recites the numbers to Pi as the chorus. Yeah, see, I love me some weird Kate Bush. That's a fun one, too, for that. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. The only ones I don't like are the sort of over-earnest early ballads. Yeah. The man with a child in his eyes and that nonsense. I can do without that. But what, she was like 17 when she wrote those? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and and a lot of the other stuff which she was writing when she was 17 was amazing. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, not that song. <laughs> no, but Hammer Horror, on the other hand, we've always got time for that. Anyway, we've said all that we care to say about the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the giant sea serpent with the short the home economic story. Mm-hmm. Do you have a final factoid to tell us before we bid farewell to the nice folks? Uh, I do not, but I understand that you have a final factoid, possibly about something scrumptious. Yeah, let's talk more about waffles. I guess I could have mentioned this earlier, but I didn't. Hey, when do you think waffles come from? Mm, I'm going to say shortly after the wheel, because the waffle is wheel-shaped. Kind of. I mean, in one sense or another, they go back to, you know, we know at least ancient Greece. And, you know, definitely by the Middle Ages, there are things that are even more recognizable as waffles. But uh, then they got bigger and bigger and really sort of solidified in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And then, of course, waffles led to their most uh, iconic non-waffle use, which is... In the 1904 World's Fair. What will happen? Well, the story goes that at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, of which, you know, at least one movie has been made, uh, a guy named Ernest Hamwe, a Syrian living in America, was selling waffles or waffle-like pastries in a booth right next to an ice cream vendor. And the ice cream was so popular on that hot, hot day that the vendor of ice cream ran out of dishes. And so the waffle guy rolled up one of his waffle-like substances into a cone, and that is where the ice cream cone comes from. Oh. And so you're saying the original ice cream cone was the superior cone, the waffle cone. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like, that papery one comes much later, I believe. Yeah, that one sucks. Yeah. Although that story is not 100% true. It may be true. Like, that may have happened, but somebody else had a patent for ice cream cones a few years earlier. <laughs> a guy named Italo Marchioni, who, you know, you might guess from his name, was was of Italian heritage living in New York City. Yeah, I think his name translates to Italian man. <laughs> <laughs> more or less. More or less. But either way, uh, you know, the waffle led to the ice cream cone, and the ice cream cone is real good. Yeah. Yeah. And, as, and we, so we should celebrate the waffle early and often. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you've got any good waffle recipes, or if you'd like to ask us anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, and we're on Twitter at it is just a show. We'd love to hear from you. The show is made possible by listeners just like you. For as little as a dollar an episode, you can help us research and record this show, and you can listen to all our superfan bonus bits. Find out more at itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 91. Well, I think we've said everything that we could possibly say about the... Movie. So, <laughs> what are we yeah. going to do? You, do you mean the saga of the Viking women and their voyage to the waters of the great sea serpent? That's the one. Yay! So, uh, what are we going to do next time on It's Just a Show? We're going to finish saying the title of this week's movie, and then we're going to look at Season 8, Episode 9, I Was a Teenage Werewolf. Ooh, so we're, we're coming to an end for the nine-episode string of dull black and white movies. <laughs> Although hopefully this one's a little more exciting. It's got Michael Landon in it, and it is one of the more infamous AIP pictures. I can't remember if I've seen this episode or not. Like my memory of watching season eight is hazy. Some episodes I remember super clearly, some I don't. Uh I just remember falling off during that season. I feel like I've heard about this movie outside of its connection with MST3K. Yeah. So I'm excited for us to talk about it. Yeah, I think it'll be I think it'll be loads of fun. And hey, who doesn't love werewolf movies? Especially teenage werewolf movies. And who doesn't love Michael Landon? See, there you go. A, a really appealing to the teen crowd. <laughs> are you are you ready to binge watch Little House on the Prairie? Uh and Highway to Heaven, yes. <laughs> and Bonanza? <laughs> sure. Well, all right. But until then, Saga! Look, look, look at my crotch! Look at my crotch! Take it away, theme squad.
Hello.